Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this. Well, I say morning and it's uh, then I remember that it's not morning for anyone else. I think it's just morning for me, but um, it's, it's about 11 a.m. here. OK. Oh, good. So me and Greg, uh, Greg's in Chicago. He's our special guest today. And then I've got my three regular co-hosts. Uh, ben Toth and Paige Hungry, Carlo Parcelli in Washington, D.C., incomer coming from a suburb in Moscow. Um, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Greg, very much for being our guest. Uh, I see that we already have several, uh, several live viewers. Thank you, live viewers. Uh, we totally appreciate that. Uh, yeah, if you want to just let us know where you are viewing from, that would be tremendous. Um, so a lot of great news, uh, Today, I mean, this week, really, I mean, things are just uh, happening very quickly all over the place, and it doesn't look good for Western imperialism. But, uh, you know, they, they, they're making these promises. So that's kind of a reference to our title today. The ironclad support is being offered to everyone from Israel, the Philippines, Ukraine, Japan, um, and there's probably a half dozen more places that, that escape me currently. But uh, where where to start, guys? Um, I know, uh, yeah. So I know uh, I just learned a second ago. Breaking news: uh, Ian let everyone know that uh, Russell Bentley has been uh, missing for about four days. So that's that's like a serious issue. We are definitely sorry to hear about that. Uh, Ian, could you just uh, maybe share the the context in uh, within which this has taken place? Yes, so Russell Bensley, for those of you who don't know, he is an American uh, citizen, um, Army veteran who um, went to Donetsk uh, all the way back in 2014, right when, after Maiden and the war started, uh, he, he, he went there as a volunteer, and then uh, his fighting career was a little brief. He switched to journalism because, you know, as a Westerner, as an outsider, he was found to be helpful to um, getting the message out, getting the Donbass advocacy out to, you know, non-Russian speaking audiences, to English speaking audiences. So he became a big you know, journalist and advocate actually in Donbass, and that's where he stayed um, even after hostilities cooled down a bit after 2014. And he stays there. He married a Russian woman there, and... Um, Unfortunately, so basically what's happened is on April 8th, there was another shelling in Donetsk, and um, he left his wife and ran towards where the sound was, and then he's been missing ever since. So some of his personal possessions were found afterwards, his phone was found, but Russell himself is, uh, is gone. And he's also not been on social media either, because I looked... As soon as I saw the story, you know, he's, he's just been, he went dark. So, and the police apparently officially list him as missing right now. There's no further information yet. So we're going to hope for the best. Um, I, I I will promise that uh, I will do everything to get him on our program uh, if once he, uh, once he uh, returns. Um, I know uh, Regis has had him on his program several times. He's talked with Scott Ritter and, you know, all the regulars, but yeah, he's, He's a tremendous hero, and um, so we hope for his speedy return. Um, yeah, and Paulie is right. Uh, she, she, he was one of the first to report uh, from the Donbass area before Mike, the, the known as foreign agent, before the guy who also has a name like Dugan, uh, something, something Dugan, another American. Yeah, Texas, Texas Bentley. And I just want to add that you can, I've seen this on Telegram, but Ian checked it out that it's basically mainstream now. So it's on Reuters. It's like officially on the missing list in Donetsk. So uh, it sounds like foul play. I don't want to yeah. uh, speculate, but I, uh, yeah, wish for hope for the best. And Russell did write a book, which I've read. It's not, it's a little esoteric. It's not advertised very widely but he did write a book about his experiences in 2014 which i read and it's very good um yeah unfortunately i can't ask him right now how where people can buy it but it's out there that he did write a book oh, he, he's I kind of documenting it. how um the the kiev regime was was uh, persecuting uh re, you know ethnic he's Russian. done a lot of that he's very active on social media he does a lot of interviews he does a lot of um 
in-person engagements, like he'll travel. I know he's traveled back into like to Moscow and other big cities and different presentations there. And he wrote a book and his book is more on a personal level. It's about how he first heard the news about the Maidan revolution, the fighting was breaking out. And so he basically just bought a plane ticket, went through Rostov and Adan and uh, basically found a militia, an ad hoc militia there. And, and not in Rostov, in Donetsk. And basically started started fighting right from the beginning, right from the opportunities for that. Very good. This is a very good first person. Probably the best thing I've seen. Yeah, so we hope uh, we hope he's okay, and we will. Uh, I will reach out to him and have him on a program to discuss things. Uh, so I asked our viewers just to let us know where they're from. So we've got Canada, we've got Norway, we've got Missouri, uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, quite an international audience. So that, that's uh, that's that's. Um, <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, uh, and another one from Belgium. Well, Amsterdam. Where's Amsterdam? That's also in, well, Nether Nether Netherlands. Netherlands, yeah. yeah. Okay, guys. Um, so, ironclad support. Where, um, where exactly is, where is, the, where is the West winning? Like, what, what? What battlefield, what situation is the U.S. Um, you know, winning the struggle against the uh, imperialist resistance? Anywhere? Doesn't look like it. Not in any active conflict. They're winning in the TV. They're, they're winning in the PR mm -hmm. media war. And I'm when I saw, we got some clips with uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Washington. And I'm just wondering what the fuck would I feel? If I were Japanese, looking at all this, I mean, just like, uh, who was the uh, American American Pie guy? That was the South Korean. The South Korean, yeah. South Korean uh, Yoon Suk Yeol. I would feel totally embarrassed, but this guy made it worse. So maybe you guys want to watch a couple of clips and, and yes. think, think what you. All right. So here we start off with the headlines were the Star Trek theme because yeah, that's that's what he does. He's a Westernized puppet. There's a new puppet in town. Let's listen. I don't hear anything. I am an idiot because again, I didn't add to the sharing that I have to have system audio. Sorry about this guys. Billy Bob had a wonderful four nights of sleep. Unfortunately, mine was a little bit more rough. So hopefully now if I play it, you should hear something. Yes. Let me conclude with the line from Star Trek. I wish you all luck to boldly go where no one has gone before. Hooray! Clash! <laughs> to propose a toast to our voyage to the frontier of the Japan US relationship with this world. Boldly go. And boldly go. Cheers. I mean, that to me is just uh, a grand scale humiliation. But on top of it, he was sent to Arlington Cemetery, guys, just just to, uh, to he was forced to do this. Is this I, to apologize? Is to apologize for Pearl Harbor? Is that what that was? Is that that's uh, bowing for the dead enemy, I guess. Uh, and on top of that, then Joe Biden, this this old guy, was standing next to him, uh, saying uh, these things. It's very short. Last one. Well, we are the same, Japan and the United States. Many we may be divided by distance, but the generations after generation, we've been brought together. The same hopes, the same values. Well, I mean, I think that should have been uh, filmed basically on on Maui Island, maybe in Pearl Harbor. He itself. said, <laughs> "He said we were fight. We fought for the same values. Is that what he said?" Yes, for generation over generation. Yeah, we, we are the same. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We yeah. are fighting for the same values. That's good to know. That's good yeah, to know. No, keep the emperor, emperor, <laughs> emperor in power, and yeah. Ah, I, mean, what, I, I don't even know what that means. 
Final Ironclad is a civil I'm war. I'm not player. sure Biden even knows what that means, no. to be honest. He saw it in the teleprompter and he said it. So ask his speechwriter what it means. <laughs> All right. I, what's, what, I'm one just going to say that ironclad is a, is a civil war term for uh, a ship made of made of iron that was used in the civil war. It's it's an, an anachronism. It's some kind of cliche. And, oh, anyway. I didn't know that. Final one. Uh, okay. There are also, I guess, Japanese speechwriters, or we just got the papers from Washington. But this is the last one where he talked about the Russians persisting in nuclear threats like again. Bring up today, maybe East Asia of tomorrow. By the way, that was the Ukraine of today. It just got cut off. So the Ukraine of today is the East Asia of tomorrow. And I guess he's proud of volunteering this information. Anyway, going on. Two standing ovation, of course. Uh, furthermore, Russia continues to threaten the use of nuclear weapons, uh, which has contributed uh, to worldwide concern that yet another catastrophe by nuclear weapon use is a real possibility. In this reality, bring... I mean, yeah, that's it. That's the clip. I, I don't know where to put that. The only nation in the world that ever got nuked twice mm -hmm. by the U.S., saying this to U.S. Congress. The, there was, a, I forget what year it was, but that Olympics that happened in Japan a few years back, I forget which year it was, but um, the Japanese, it actually fell on, the, one of the days of the Olympics fell on August 8th, the anniversary of the, I think it was the Hiroshima. I can't, I honestly can't remember if it was Hiroshima or the Nagasaki bombing, but basically they requested to do a moment of silence for the bombing victims and the um, international committee basically said no so basically <laughs> japan has to honor the victims of this nuclear holocaust and the usa essentially said no <laughs> no I, I even guess, though it's happening in your country we can't do that no i, I guess there wasn't it. an smo yet so it, they couldn't do it and blame russia at that time maybe it was <laughs> well, it was before <laughs> Well, you know, they're yeah, already no, I mean, blaming. The, I mean, I, I wonder how long it'll be before they say Russia was somehow responsible for it. Well, well actually, <laughs> they could blame Russia because uh, many scholars say, and I agree with them, that the re main one of the main reasons they nuked uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was to uh, deter the Soviet Union. Uh, to to threaten basically the Soviet Union. It's, right. it's well documented. It's declassified that it was a message to Stalin. Step yeah. out of line. This happens to you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, yeah, you know the totally Rosenbergs. Oh, go ahead. The Rosenbergs, <laughs> the people who leaked the nuclear America's nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. I mean, they got Sm the death smuggled penalty. them out. Yes. Yes, they got the death penalty. I mean, you can tell how mad they were that it, they didn't have that. Um, monopoly right. on nuclear weapons anymore. That completely changed the ballgame. I mean, I'm sure that Soviet Union would have eventually developed it on their own even without that leaked information, but still, it's just... It's, 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 I mean, they got the death penalty. I mean, you really have to get the man to get sentenced to death and actually executed that quick, like the Rosenbergs yeah. did. So. In an important yeah. scientific field. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. tough. So the, the context within which um, this this uh, fealty to to Western Western Westernism, uh, you know, demonstrated by the what is it the president of Japan or the prime minister prime minister of Japan prime minister Kishida um, yeah. is essentially the it's the pivot to Asia right it's the it's the new coming Cold War against China and we have to enlist Japan and and Japan can't be constrained by these. Uh, archaic World War II treaties that says they can't have a military, an offensive military. So we've got to, you know, uh, reinvigorate that relationship. We've got to start developing and building up Japan's military so we can use them like we used Ukraine as a proxy, um, but this time against China. And so, so that's the context within which this is taking place. And it's basically the prime minister is demonstrating his fealty to U.S. supremacy by saying, hey, I will enlist my country, our country's blood and our country's economy in the service of your anti-China um, you know, uh, ambitions. 
Well, it's, anti, it's anti-Russia too. I mean, Japan is an important uh, partner. That's the word they like to use. An important partner against Russia as well. I mean, Don't forget the Kuril Islands, which went yes. to the Soviet Union yeah. in 1945. No, yeah. no, great point. And so you could hear him saying, you know, we totally stand with the West against Russia on the issue of Ukraine. Um, but, but that, you know, it's yeah. That was part of the most enjoyable uh, things that uh, Kishida and Marcos Bongo, the junior of the Philippines uh, prime minister, they were both in the White House lawn, you know, holding hands mm -hmm. like two diligent puppets. But when he addressed Congress, which is when he said that the Ukraine of today is the East Asia's tomorrow, he was lobbying for aid, for the aid to uh, Ukraine. Basically, you know, that's what's most enjoyable to me. Like this thing is falling wow. apart so fast. A lot of the headlines are about alarm. We're running out. There's no air defense. It's like it, it could crumble all of that. And he went there to address Congress to put uh, some aid in there. And a second, uh, I wouldn't call it a puppet, but someone who still thinks he's relevant uh, is um, the foreign they don't have ministers. The foreign secretary of, of uh, Britain, David Cameron, also went there and he got refused uh, to speak with uh, the speaker, who his name is Mike Johnson. He got refused by Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor. But he still went to Congress. And I sped it up because, you know, English are they're slow. But let's just see. Let's just see his statement there. He's support from NATO allies and a good outcome to the NATO summit, which we were discussing this morning. And we know that they need money in the form of the frozen Russian sovereign assets. And we're making good progress in how to access that funds on an agreed basis. And I think we can take forward to the G7. And of course, in terms of the money they need and the support they need, perhaps nothing is more important than the supplemental that the Congress is looking at at the moment. And I come here with um, no intention to lecture anybody or tell anybody what to do or get in the way of the process of politics and other things in the United States. I just come here as a great friend and believer in this country and a believer that it's profoundly in your interest and your security and your future and the future of all your partners to release this money and, and let it through. And I'm looking forward to meetings I'm going to be having in Congress um, later today. And about so it's it's in your interest. It's the Lindsey Graham best investment we ever made. They're oh. all panicking that this thing won't. And by the way, he had to grovel to Trump. And apparently that meeting does not did not go well. A lot of the European diplomats are having to go to Trump. They don't want to. But apparently that's the guy to go to if you want to get this past Congress. And I'm, I'm loving the hell out of this. I, I, I really am, especially that Japan says, hey, you just let these guys be destroyed and, and we're next at least there's some self-preservation instinct there mm -hmm. that's what i you know there's a back there's a little bit of back history between eastern europe and japan actually not many people know this but um after the pearl harbor attack and the japanese declaration of war on the usa the usa declared war back and the usa's allies were also obligated to declare war on japan as well because they're allies of the usa including the Polish government in exile. And Japan actually oh, rejected really? rejected Poland's declaration of war. They just said we don't accept it because we we like Poland and we understand that Poland is obligated to declare war on us because they're allies of the USA. And what's interesting about that is because when Germany invaded Poland, Japan was actually very upset about it because. Germany had made a backroom deal with the Soviet Union and Soviet Union and Japan, even though they had a non-aggression pact, they did not. I mean, after that, they stopped trusting Hitler, much like, you know, the West did stopped trusting Hitler. Because like if you're making willing to make a deal with the Soviet Union once, that just was a, the Japanese considered that a total breach of trust. And that was significant because Germany was pressuring Japan to open a second front with the Soviet Union, because you know, so because of the oil embargo by the U.S. and Britain, the Japanese basically had a choice: do we attack the Soviet Union or do we attack, you know, the Western colonies and get for a new source of oil? So they ended up opting. You know, we don't want to <laughs> relive the you know the Manchurian War with the Soviet Union, so they opted to do Pearl Harbor and attack the Philippines and Singapore. Um, so that's. A bit I'd like extra. to make a but, comment about a Star Wars comment and see if you can find it in my conversation, my, my, my little speech here. If uh, Japan uh, wants to pick a fight with China, China has got, uh, is, is still bur uh, burning over the occupation of Japan prior to World War II and during World War II. And what they, Japan did to China, uh, raping women, 
uh, Nanking. Uh, Nanking or Nanjing uh, Massacre. Just read horrific. up on it. It's horrific. I, they mm -hmm. were horrific. And and believe me, if Japan wants to get involved, uh, China is is ready. And, and China will, will take that little turkey apart. Um, there's not a country, there's not a, a country in this galaxy, that's a Star Trek reference, in this galaxy that would prefer to go out and dismember Japan than China. Let them try it. Dumbass. I'm sorry. So there's a, there's a, I, I like the history angle and I have a few items to share and I'm not sure what relevance Ian will take from these points. But it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, Hitler was really hoping that Japan would um, open up a second front against, you know, the Soviets and cause them to have to fight a two front war. And he actually that was actually the reason why Hitler threw a Hail Mary pass by declaring war on the United States. So he didn't have any reason to declare war on the United States, but when uh, Japan attacked the United States, the United States declared war against Japan. And then, um, you know, Germany didn't need to declare war against the United States, but because they were allied with Japan and because they really wanted to show solidarity and, and hope that, you know, Japan mm -hmm. would respond by opening up a front in the Soviet Union. Oh, I didn't know Hitler that. foolishly declared war against the United States. Um, he initiated that. The United <laughs> States probably wouldn't have even bothered. I mean, maybe later they would have done it. But the way it, it, it played out was that Hitler did that in order to try and show how strong, how close he was with Japan in the hopes that Japan <laughs> would reciprocate. And that never happened, um, obviously. And the other thing was, you know, it was it was not until like the day of or even the day after, immediately following um, Russia's or the Soviet Union's peace deal with Japan in the east that they did go into Poland. It was like the, the, the same day or the next day that they went into Poland. It was a, a few weeks after Germany had went into Poland. Uh, once they secured their eastern flank with an, a, an official treaty, or at least a ceasefire of some sort. That's when they went into Poland. But um, so it's some interesting history that definitely we don't learn in social studies because you know everything we learn in the in the West is um, sanitized for liberal consumption and to you know push the liberal the liberal false liberal liberal narratives. You know, I want to yeah. add to that ahead. what you said is the I mean this. Anglo-Japanese alliance isn't new either. It started early 20th century. Um, you know, Japan was obligated to, was basically for, because they were very isolationist up until the USA sent their white fleet on a tour and basically forced them to take a trade deal that was actually very disadvantageous to them, honestly. It was very beneficial for Western powers, disadvantageous to Japan, but so that was the stick. But the carrot was that um, the British and U and USA and France recognized Japan as the big hegemon in East Asia, and there were there were two big treaties with them with the Anglo's and the Japanese that made them feel very big. And then in the 1930s, when they started their war with China under the Roosevelt administration, the Roosevelt took China's side, which was very confusing and angering to the Japanese. This is like, we know you don't care about the Chinese. You don't care how many, you know, you don't, since when have Anglos ever cared about how many Chinese people are killed ever? Um, now you're all of a sudden putting out all this propaganda. You're taking, you're sending arms and money to China. The Japanese- Flying tigers. So the flying they tigers could, yeah. yeah, they could just, could not- I mean, they also why the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union also sent pilots and aids to China, too, which isn't um, publicized heavily now for obvious reasons. But, you know, they could understand how the Soviet Union, but why, why are our allies, why are the Anglos doing this to us? That was very angering and insulting to the Japanese Empire. You know, they could not. Their first, their first lesson in... Uh... Anglo Anglo treachery. Yes, <laughs> it is because you know they thought uh, they, not the last you know, when last they thing. had that treaty with the Anglo's with the Anglo powers. They thought that signaled respect. Oh, you know the Westerners, the white man respects us as fellow warriors, and that's just it was. And I think that's 
important lesson. You know, when the British and the USA sign a treaty with you, it's not respect. You're just at that particular moment useful doesn't mean they respect you, yeah. which is no, what the exactly. Japanese interpreted as respect. And it wasn't. you right. wish current Japan would have that understanding now that, I mean, you guys are, you're, you're it's pathetic it's to see Kishida over there, um, you know, giving Star Trek references. Uh, it's so, yeah. I mean, at least some of our viewers probably watching, you froze, I hope you're still with us, you're with us, uh, watching Shogun, which is now the big hit on mm -hmm. one of the broadcast services. And that's when the British were introduced. Apparently, the Portuguese uh, kind of monopolized the Japan connection until the British came along. 16th, 15th century, I think it's played in. But I want to go a little bit on the economic angle. I had no idea that IG Farben, the German petrochemical uh, company, also, I guess, uh, supported Japan's uh, war effort. But getting into this energy war situation, you've all read that uh, the Ukrainians struck a bunch of um, Russian refineries and Russia finally struck mm -hmm. back and basically de-energized Kharkov, now the big Kiev uh, thermal plant. And I read an article, this was November in Bloomberg, that the petrochemical industry is at a 50-year low. So that's Cold mm -hmm. War uh, levels uh, basically gone. And the other thing, Sean Fu, I, if you're ever watching this, please come on the show. I know you're too big to us, but you're a great economic uh, guy. Mentioned that Japan is a couple of islands where 60% of the food is imported and 90% of the energy, you know, that's, that's, that's Russia, China, that sort of stuff. Uh, is imported that for them it's doomsday to be uh, sinking the yen apparently is un now unmoored and sinking compared to the dollar to to import yeah, anything sorry, it's, that's it's, a, a, it's that's a it's a death this, deal to them as well but go ahead Ian. i'm sorry just to clarify your last comment so, so the you said the pet you said the petrol industry is at a, what is, are you talking that's globally europe or russia in Europe. In, in Europe, is at a 50-year low since, uh, the you know, basically the cheap Russian energy is cut off. Mm -hmm. I just read, by the way, that uh, still half of Russian exports in LNG, that's the uh, pricey liquefied stuff that you need special ships and special terminals to do, that still comes to Europe. The second is China with 21%. But China has taken all, basically all the uh, pipeline, the cheap pipeline gas that used to flow to Europe via, among others, Nord Stream. So that's been completely rearranged. And therefore, you know, petrochemical is not just, uh, you know, uh, diesel and uh, kerosene that goes into airplanes. It's plastic. It's, uh, it's the plastic bags, uh, fiber. It's all sorts of uh, products made based on petroleum. That's dead in the water in Europe. And Japan apparently uh, is facing a very similar energy woes. I mean, they don't have like a million solar panels or a million wind farms to get with the with the green agenda. A lot yeah. of that was still imported and not looking good for a, an import nation. You know, that that was the, the observation. That reminds me of some of the biggest news that we've had in Ukraine, you know, over the past couple of days since our last episode was that, um, you know, the, the Russia has really done a number on the electrical grid and the, you know, the, the power production grid in Ukraine. So they hit a real big, uh, was it hydroelectric production or? It's a thermal plant and I think thermal, gas based, the, the one in Kiev, the mm, tree, yeah. tree something. I always think so, of Trizu because that's the, the, what do you call it? The trident, the, the Ukraine symbol. So they're finally, um, you know, taking these steps. And, and the reason I think this step was taken because the U.S. would have done this on day one, right? Like when right. the U.S. first would have gone to war, they would have just destroyed the infrastructure capacity, the electrical capacity of that whatever country they're attacking Pretty on well. day one. People, but, yeah. people dug up articles that they boasted about this thing in Yugoslavia, exactly as you said, mm -hmm. like de-energizing the Serbs. They boasted about it. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, so that, you know, that was a, a response to perhaps, you know, the concert attack, perhaps the drone attacks on, uh, Russian, you know, oil, oil, um, pipelines, refineries, infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we see is, you know, a, a slow escalation on you know, as a response, an escalatory response to the actions from the West and Kiev. But what I want to point out is from the very beginning, from 2014, we see a slow rollout, a slow rollout of escalatory mechanisms by the West. So it started with javelins, right? Are we going to send lethal aid? And and everybody's like, no, that's a step too far. We're not going to send lethal aid. Yeah. At and the time, the Germans sent helmets, I think. They sent helmets. <laughs> 
And and it's kind of like you could imagine how this was all planned out years ago. And they're like, okay, we're going to roll things out like this. We're going to do a slow escalation over the years. And then at some point, we're going to get our boots on the ground, right? We're going to get our, that's going to be one of the final escalatory, um, you know, steps in order to have a full, you know, a full war with Russia, if necessary. We're going to try and avoid that. But these are all the steps we can take and, and roll out over over a several years time. Um, so that's the question. Like, uh, has this been planned out? Like, is 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 there no doubt that there's going to be a full regional war because the 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 resistance is preparing for that? I mean, you see Kim Jong uh, Un in North Korea saying, "Hey, it's war. Let's mobilize. It's this is going to go down." And um, so so they're they're sending a. a you know, a message to the resistance that um, we're not going to back down and they have no reason to think they're going to back down. It's only prudent and responsible for the resistance countries to prepare to, for, 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 for full war. Does you guys agree? So we're talking about the Asia Pacific region now because I'm kind of, I was still in Ukraine. I'm not sure. Well, I, I'm, I'm talking it's Iran, Iran, North Korea, um, China. The axis of evil. The axis of evil is yeah, there. the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, just quickly, a couple of yeah. comments still sticking to okay. Ukraine. One thing okay. I found fantastic is they've been bombarded with these FAP 3000s. Apparently, this was a brand new missile, even more advanced than the Kinjar, maybe Ian knows about this, that hit this and, and destroyed all the headlines where it's utterly destroyed this uh, thermal power plant. It's interesting that no apartment blocks got hit recently now that there's no air defense. Just something to think about because they like to put that in. Right. They like, like to, to put that in civil areas and apparently everybody is hunting for the fabled patriot system which is uh nowhere to be found you know that's observation one when it comes to ukraine uh and the second one is that they they dream i don't know why they still dream that they're going to have this peace formula that the zelensky 10 point peace plan and they're they're planning for it in in switzerland i think the date has been set to be mid-june and Lavrov just basically addressed it, that saying, no, this is a road to nowhere. It's, it's, it's a capitulation plan. We're ready to talk seriously, but this is not it. And if we want to still stick with this, we can move on uh, next. But I have a quick, um, like, serious uh, appearance by Vasilina Benzia, who is the main um, ambassador of Russia to the UN, who had some interesting things to say. And I'm just going to do, like, maybe one and a half speed. I really like it that he's a big, bold man who kind of looks like the father of Hungarian communism, but the translator is like a cute, girly uh, sound, but check this out. Nothing more than a private military company fighting for the West using Western weapons, and they're fighting to the last Ukrainian. All that's left for the Kiev regime to do under the circumstances is, in their important rage and in the worst terrorist traditions, to deliberately shell peaceful neighborhoods in Russian cities. They're conducting actual terrorist attacks, and this is how the Kiev regime will go down in history, a monstrous, inhumane regime of terrorists and Nazis. A regime that's traded in the interests of its people, sacrificing them in return for Western money and handouts for the benefit of Zelensky and his inner circle. Under these circumstances, attempts of the leader of the Kiev regime to promote his formulae, to convene summits in support of the Kiev regime, provoke nothing but bafflement. Very soon, the only topic at any international meeting on Ukraine will be the unconditional sur surrender of the Kiev regime. I advise you all to prepare for this in advance. Thank you very much. I advise you all to prepare for this in advance. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, uh, you can take this as war propaganda. I only have written uh, stuff about it, but Vladimir Putin met with uh, Lukashenko, the Belarusian uh, leader in Moscow, and he said that these strikes were, we had to respond to the strikes on the energy sector. So that's uh, quoted, but he also said that for humanitarian mm -hmm. reasons, we didn't want to do this in the winter because, you know, hospitals and schools without yeah. heating and all that. So that's his official reasoning mm. behind this. That's what I wanted to add to the Ukraine story. Now we can go wherever you want. Well, I'll add that um, the numbers are out for 2023 and the um, Ukrainian birth rate is now at around 1.0. It's actually just in raw numbers. Oh God, I have it's to find something. one of the lowest in Ukrainian history, like mm. um, that region back in the early 1800s like 1721 like I, I remember there was an exact year cited uh, so so that last year's was around 186,000 live births and it was actually higher than that even even back when the ukraine region had around five six million people in total 
it was around 200, 250,000 live births a year. So it's just, it's actually lower than it was in the early 1800s when you had a mm-hmm. fraction of the population. So wow. it's, I mean, it's a little bit misleading. I, mean, I have to be fair, it's a little bit misleading because a lot of the refugees are not in Ukraine. So, so if a woman's pregnant, she might go to Germany or something, have the child there. But still, I mean, that's that's looking really bad for Ukraine demographically. They really did. How about this? Decimate a whole generation. I mean, that's oh, amazing. Wow. By, kudos to the New York Times for actually running an infographic, but that's horrendous. Most of these graphs look like basically a pyramid, most in the middle and sort of tapering off to the end. This hole is exclusive to Ukraine. So one day we'll hear about, hear about the actual casualty numbers, and I'm afraid it's going to be half, I mean, half a million or uh, half a billion or more. And I don't half think, million, I don't know if we covered this in the previous show, but um, they did push through that new mobilization bill. Yeah. And there were a couple big factors that one, they removed most, like even the horrendous uh, medical deferments, like HIV being HIV positive is no longer um, a medical deferment, which is very serious because um, for soldiers, you have to be able to give blood to each other. There's just a uh. lot of, you know, it's just, and there's no, you know, you just, it's a it's an environment where you don't want someone who's HIV positive, even on medication, even on medication where you can get the viral levels low. You just don't want an HIV positive person in that yeah. environment. But they lifted that restriction. And also it's Ukraine. Um, Russia has a similar problem with HIV. It's just worse in Ukraine. So uh, where a lot of people just don't take the anti. What about yeah. what about Down syndrome? Hmm. Well, Down you saw- Yes, I, I think I, I'm not going to show it, but I think for that, or does that mean you still have to go to the front? I, I mean, it's just I've, I've guys, seen some videos. Epilepsy, we all have. mentally handicapped, just all those waivers are gone now. Just, Invalids, they all have to be rechecked for for mobilization, and of course, mm-hmm. everybody's pressuring them to just roll out the women, which uh, they have been. Sadly, there's a lot of new gravestones with, <sighs> with women. The big thing, I would say, one of the biggest, most success, one of the most significant aspects of this bill, though, is that they got it through on this promise that, you know, we're, you know, I think even Zelensky said this, you know, part of the, we're not doing this just because of losses. We're doing this to get the boys home. You know, those guys who have been at the front Mm -hmm. since January, February of 2022 can after two years of being in the trenches go home. But now they're saying, well, just kidding. Actually, those guys are still stuck there. We're not demobile. We're not going to do a demobilization. Mm -hmm. It's 500,000 in addition to who we already have at the front. It's there seems, there seems to be tr- trouble with discipline. I don't remember which uh, sort of regiment this is, but there was in Sputnik, so Russian sources, but uh, sources within uh, the, this Azov battalion said no. They said no to defending Chasov. Yeah, they just, they just said, fuck that. We're not following this order. So there's a growing problem of, problem of that too, people not following the meat what, grinder uh, orders. Sorry, well, Carlo. Know, I'm sorry. Wait, you know... The, 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 the conscription age in Ukraine, it's curious to me, maybe somebody can help me out with this. It wasn't, what didn't they just lower it? It was in the mid-20s and you couldn't have anyone younger than somebody 26? 27. Yeah. 20, it went from 27 uh, to well, 25. That's curious 25. because, you know, I, I was... I was this is the chart that we saw the birth rate dropped in the 90s so much and after they're afraid of oh i see killing the future population i see thanks also if you go to telegram channels you will see unfortunately gravestones of people who are 70. so yeah it it, 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 these, these are just the headlines it's not i don't think it's the full reality there's a couple of um points I want to make on that question, Carlo, actually. So one, um, in World War II, um, the average age of an American serviceman in World War II was 26. In Vietnam, it was 19. And that's because there was a different mobilization strategy. You know, in World War II, they were just drafting people. You know, you go in that age, in those eligible age cohorts. In Vietnam, because the draft was unpopular, 
they were avoiding college age people and people with, because if you're a middle-class or upper middle-class person, you have a job, you don't want to go to Vietnam. So there would be pushback from those. So they were trying, so they couldn't really go over the college age. So they just went younger. So they're just grabbing uh, high school. So it was actually cool. unusual on a global standpoint for soldiers to be that. We kind of have this, I think that's kind of, I think for Americans, it seems weird to have older people on the front lines. I think globally, it's more true though, because we've kind of fallen into this model of draft of getting volunteers right out of high school. And also I think because for both Russia and Ukraine, so like when Russia do, did their mobilization, um, the average age of a mobilized reservist in October, in that was older, right? 35 was the yeah. average age. Uh. So they were going for guys who were, if you're gonna have children, you probably already do by that point. They didn't want, you know, and there's, I think it's also a cultural mentality that both Ukraine and Russia have, because they've had real, they had World War II, they have real wars, they have serious casualties. They're, they just, they're queasy about sending kids off to meet grinders. So that I think culturally they are happier with people in their late twenties or thirties and forties, even going to war. And that's, so it's kind of the same thing with Ukraine because Ukraine, unlike Russia does have to do conscriptions every month. And so they just, uh, they don't want to send college age. They don't want, I mean, you do find examples of younger guys who volunteered, but mostly the conscripted guys are over 27. They just, you know, they're just very, uh, and there's, I think if you start drafting people who can afford to send their kids to university, there's going to be political pushback. So that's why they're still not sending 21 year old, even though Lindsey Graham, can, can I, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to add something funny because you've probably seen the exemptions. These made Ukrainian headlines as well as Russian ones. Mm -hmm. Do you know the latest exemptions? One was circus workers and the TV channels. They are critical and essential for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So clowns and uh, PR people, they still don't get. So, I mean, it sounds like, you know, drafting women, drafting younger people, these are contingencies that they can definitely pursue in the future. But right now they're going to limit themselves to mobilizing, you know, males up to or uh, down to 25 years of age. But for now, um, I guess, you know, certain people are safe, but that doesn't mean that in a month from now that that can change. Uh, depending on the conditions so it's just what's unconscionable is how the west has no regard they don't care that all these people are dying like it doesn't it doesn't matter to them and and it just shows you the true principles that govern um you know the west and it's it's not liberal at all there's nothing liberal about it it's uh it's it's sick and cynical am i breaking up again i see i'm frozen on the screen you're frozen, but we can. The see audio you. is great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like. I wanted to mention Gregor's comment going back. Me to too. Japan. Oh, this um, is the LDP, like the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, and I didn't look up the history, but that is very interesting. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, Carlos' yeah. friend, Gregor Yankovic. The history. The history, of course, was that um, Japan did not want to surrender to the Soviet Union. But it was the Soviet Union's declaration of war against Japan that caused them to surrender. But they were more than happy to surrender to um, the United States. And ever since then, they've been a vassal. So the United States totally controls their economy and their politics. And there's been assassinations of socialists. You know, popular socialist pol pol politicians have been assassinated. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the the assassination with the sword on stage, just a guy got killed with a sword, uh, a socialist got killed with a sword by a fascist, hmm. um, you know, probably probably with, you know, great ties well, to Western intelligence. Go ahead, sir. More a dagger, like a tanto, a short sword, a dagger. But yes, uh, there, there's a, it's famous because there was a, a picture just before the moment he died. I thought it was a katana, but maybe it wasn't a katana. It's a shorter thing. Okay, okay. Um, the big thing I would add the big thing with Japan in World War II is they were what I mean they were even early 1945 were trying to were actually approaching the Soviet Union because the big thing Japan and not the USA and the reason why is Japan was fishing for a conditional surrender. They wanted to keep the empire and they wanted to keep the emperor in power. Ironically, they did keep the emperor in power as a 
authority figure, but um, that was when Truman took office, he was big on, he wanted Japan to unconditionally surrender. That was partially what led to the two nuclear bombings to uh, force that. I, yeah. the, I, I think this is factual, but I don't have it at my fingertips. I read that there was a big headline or maybe uh, Emperor Hirohito did a, a radio address to the nation and it was like the, the w best understatement ever in history. And he said that uh, events in the war have turned not necessarily in our favor. I think that's what he said <laughs> after, after the two two bombings, just a small anecdote. So, yeah, I mean, ever since then, they have just been a, 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 a stronghold of Western imperialism to project um, power, you know, like Australia, like South Korea, um, Japan, Western Europe. And, uh, and so it's unfortunate. It's unfor I mean, the, the people have benefited because they've had a, uh, a quality of life. You know, they've had um, higher living standards thanks to the Marshall Plan-esque uh, you know, uh, aid that we gave them to help build them back up after the war. Um, you know, a as a, again, as a stronghold against uh, the communist bloc. So, um, you know. I don't know how true that is because it's glitzy. It's neon like, but you know, they are, they always call it the famous work ethic, but they are the most overworked uh, people on the planet. They have worse demographics than Europe. And that's saying something because Europe has a very uh, aging uh, population, you know, and, uh, you know, Plaza Accords, basically what they were good at was uh, electronics and robots that got you know, cut from under them. And uh, apparently uh, some Western magazines, Bloomberg included, said there's, they're fudging a lot of numbers to show mm. that that great GDP yeah. prosperity, which is which is Western tradition. So, yeah, that's that's a Western thing. No, and but, it's and it's definitely getting it's not getting it's not improving. Like their economy is in the decline, just like South Korea, um, just like the United States. Nation. I mean, all of the West is their economies are declining. But, um, you know, after World War II, of course, the United States was untouched. They accounted for half the global economy. And with that 50%. huge disproportion of wealth, they were able to build up other, you know, strongholds against the communists. Well, so they gave aid. They gave a lot of economic aid to South Korea, Japan, Western Europe. And um, while at the same time, of course, they had an embargo against the, the socialist states and they were engaged in sabotage and undermining them. And so... Um, that was the Cold War that we saw play out. Um, but definitely, you know, there was a time where, um, you know, you would hear Westerners do comparisons of South Korea with North Korea and say, look, capitalism is obviously better. Look how people are living in South Korea. And, um, and, and they use that. Go ahead. And they use that satellite the photo, the which was line, yeah. that was mm -hmm. taken on Earth Day. Earth Day is when North Korea shuts off all the lights uh, and say, oh, you no know, kidding. this is for the planet. They <laughs> took that picture then and they use it. Look what communism does. Elon Musk <laughs> uses that goddamn picture. I wanted to add something also funny, uh, what, not kind of funny, but important. In Europe, you know, we have the um, Sovereignty Protection Bureau in Hungary, which is kind of like your foreign agent law, where money comes from. And I looked at the list of identified, obviously, NED, George Soros' Open Society Foundation. And the third one is interesting because it's the German Marshall Fund. It's identified as U.S. money, uh, U.S. influence. So I think people in Europe should take notice. If you have a TV channel or something funded by the German Marshall Fund, it might not be uh, peddling for your best interests. Just a small, interesting tidbit. Well, we we definitely, I mean, our propaganda apparatus, you know, is 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 just as powerful, if not more powerful, in those countries that you know are our our ideological allies, you know, the South Korea, Japan, Western Europe. So it's, it's new puppets in control. town. And that was our goal, our agenda after the Soviet Union was dismantled um, in a in a undemocratic coup. Of course, total uh, full full spectrum dominance was the was the title for the strategy that was being pursued by the West was full spectrum dominance. So it's total political, economic and military control of every country, just like we had control of Japan, Western Europe, South Korea. We wanted to extend that over every country. And so that was a little bit too ambitious. Uh, what's his name? Thought it was going to be the end of history, but um, they were wrong. And so uh, th th thankfully for humanity, 
Um, you know, we have leaders like Xi, leaders like uh, uh, Putin. And um, so there's some, some resistance to, to that, that plan of uh, full spectrum dominance. Guys, we want to go to Israel. There's a lot to talk about there, or we can stick with uh, China, Eastern Europe. I want to hear what Greg has to think about all this. Say Which part? Oh, Greg. Greg, we've we've kept you quiet. We're so sorry. <laughs> um, any any thoughts at all uh, on on the totality of what we've discussed so far? I'm sure there's many. Well, you know that one of the things I've been watching is the back and forth about what the U.S. is going to do to defend Israel should Iran retaliate directly. And you know, there's a lot of articles about back channel deals and which I believe that the U S and Iran do not want to have a war and they're yeah, trying I believe to you. figure it out quietly. But then at the news conference with the Japanese prime minister, and then I guess the secretary of defense started saying clearly we will defend Israel against Iran, no matter what. Yeah. It's ironclad, right? They're they're supporting. They say it's ironclad. Yeah, I'm skeptical, but I mean, you know, um, Israel okay. and the neocons here have wanted us to go to a war with Iran yeah. for decades. So that would be uh, it could it could very very well end up in a global economic catastrophe where 20 percent of the world's energy, or at least oil, is is really taken off the market just 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 like that. But what's the context? So the context of all this is, you know, October 7th, Israel, um, you know, having this genocide against the Palestinians, trying to ethnically cleanse Gaza, probably take it over, add some, um, you know, add some, add some new settlements there, the beachfront settlements. And then you have the resistance to that, which is um, the Palestinians, of course, in both Gaza, the West Bank, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon. You have Iran, and you also have Yemen. You know the the true Syria. heroes, the um, the heroes of the story. That so far, I, I didn't really see this coming, but it's just been so tremendous and heroic. Um, but what you what what Israel did recently, in an effort, it seems, in an obvious effort to draw the United States more into this war, was to hit the Iranian embassy in Damascus, killing some diplomats and generals. Um, of both Syria and and Iran, and it's just a total war crime, a total provocation, a huge provocation. And so the just question to add, is, during Ramadan, okay, during the holy period, yes, makes it even a bigger provocation if that's even possible. But um, so that happened. Did that happen like right around our last broadcast, or a little bit before our last broadcast? I think it's been at least a week now. So yeah. before, yeah. So um, so. We still are awaiting to see Iran's response. And so, um, oh, yeah, no, we've talked about it a couple on a couple episodes that we believe that Iran is going to be very, um, you know, thoughtful and not really not really fall for um, the bait, which definitely seems like like a like an excuse to justify U.S. involvement in a U.S. war against Iran. But um, we still haven't seen a response from Iran. And like Greg was saying, there's these uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that Iran doesn't want to escalate and that the U.S. doesn't want to escalate. So they're working behind the scenes trying to figure out how to keep Israel from being able to do something that really pulls the U.S. in um, because there's factions in the U.S. And if Iran did certain things, um, maybe the argument is, is it would be political suicide and it would be politically impossible for the U.S. not to go to war against Iran. But anybody want to explain that? Like, why can't the U.S. just say, fuck you, Israel, you're on your own? Like, why, why is that politically impossible? Why can't that happen? Why doesn't that happen? Who are the interests? What are the forces keeping common sense from happening in uh, U.S.? You know, I thought involved. Asia was having a big impact. The fact we're getting, we want Japan to take the same kind of suicidal stance that Ukraine's taking, you know, and Israel has been our ally proxy in the Middle East too. And we don't want Japan to get any doubts as it's signing up for a suicidal war with China. Yeah, that, that, that was that my touches, take. That touches on, you know, on the core point, I think, 
is that the U.S. is behind all of this. I mean, if you think that uh, uh, the U.S. didn't know in advance about the Israeli attack on the on the Iranian embassy in in Damascus, you know, which is what they're claiming now, go back yeah. right. to kindergarten. That they were behind. They they knew everything about it. They've known every they've known everything that Israel has done. Every heinous crime that they've done, and and and, and they're in on it. Uh, they're they're perfectly the U.S. You know, let's call it the deep state. They're perfectly fine with genociding the Palestinians. In fact, they're prob they probably drew up the initial plans. I mean, let's not be naive about these mm -hmm. people. They've murdered millions of people, and oh. and and uh, and without the least compunction so of course but i'm just going to add the political angle to it because if it's an election year you know everything is about that that apparently biden is open to letting go of julian assange uh, prosecution that's obviously to get back some votes please the second one is the renewal of uh forgiving some student loan debt i think right. I read 30 million so anyway just give me some support back because what he doesn't want is the horrible pr uh, uh, that goes along with it and also remember the energy aspect that Billy Bob touched on. I mean, I read in Forbes that there might be another drawdown on Americans' SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, that Biden always taps to get the petrol prices back down a little because high petrol prices at the pump means you're not going to be elected, you know? Right. And it has 17 days of supply in it, according to this fucking Forbes well, article. It's depleted. And what, what Iran can do is destroy the infrastructure of all its neighbors, uh, destroy the, uh, what? It, and it's, they're so desperate. We all read it, I can put it on screen if you want, that they would give anything to the Houthis, basically all the concessions ever, right. just to please stop, stop this embargo, stop attacking our ships, number one. Second, the Financial Times reported that they wanted to enlist China to please persuade Iran not to do anything. Please not return, please mm -hmm. don't retaliate, please don't, please don't. So there are economic interests. Of no, course, I, there I are hot, of course, there's John Bolton. There's always idiots yeah. like him who want a massive war in the Middle East. But I don't think they're in the they're the major guys. Right. I'm I'm legit convinced that the U.S. is trying everything they can do to avoid, um, you know, being pressured into a war with Iran. And you know, they're not ready. They they want to pivot to Asia. They want to pivot to China. They don't want to have this global economic catastrophe on their hands when you know, the Straits of Hormuz are blocked and oil can't ship, can't flow through there. Um, and, and Yemen, it's hilarious that uh, originally they were offering Yemen, um, hey, if you just stop defending the Palestinians, declare neutrality, we will take you off the state sponsor of terrorism list. <laughs> and now they don't, they're, 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 they've added to that ante. Not only will they take them off the state sponsor of terrorism list, they will stop supporting the Yemen government in exile. They will declare them to be the official, the Houthis, to be the official government in, in, in Yemen. And they will give them aid and development if they would only stop defending the Palestinians. And do you think the Houthis are going to do that? No, because they're fucking principled. And their exact words, Billy Bob already had this quote in his mind. I'd really, really love it. That was their response to this huge offer from America. We are not within the circle of those you dictate. It's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Inspiring, and it shows how effective they are. Yeah, I think hugely effective. Mm -hmm. The Yemenis. It's it's always this big debate, you know. Whenever you a state, a proxy, or you know, just an appendage of the deep state like Israel or Ukraine does something, there's this debate: how much did the cent did the central brain know about it and dictate it? <laughs> And it, because, you know, on one hand, like, for example, the uh, Crocus City Hall shooting, I'm like, there's no way they could have done those financial transactions without the CIA or the National Security Agency knowing about. But on the other hand, too, it's understandable that when you're that tail on the dog, I mean, there is some tail wagging the dog. There is because if you're those guys, you're just out on a limb. And you're just like, hey, I need to do something really provocative to get mm -hmm them to help me to do so no, that's true. Ro something. rogue elements rogue elements that are not you know they have their own little brain and they might not be part of the central brain right yes and so you oh, can just yeah. say so i think there's a lot of probably a lot because you know let's be honest the war in gaza is not going well i mean they're killing huge numbers of people but conventionally it's just it's an embarrassment for the idf 
that when you have 10 to one numerical superior superiority and just, you know, half the world's industrial base supporting you that you can't defeat 20 or 30,000 teenagers with homemade weapons, it's an embarrassment. So they're probably pretty desperate right now. So I could see this idea of just like, we're going to do something really provocative that drags the USA into the fight with us. I mean, that's just, I mean. That's the last hope, last best hope. So I mean, Carlo going... made, made this point earlier that there were reports from Israel that we destroyed 30% of Hamas. Then I think uh, Nasrallah said probably 10%. But <laughs> reality is we don't know. Nobody knows. The US doesn't know the extent of those networks, the people, but we know there are still active fighting. The Markaba tanks are still being destroyed. And mm -hmm. one thing I'll add to that, a rare opinion piece, like a full editorial uh, on Haaretz, I think it was yesterday. This was the title, saying what can't be said. Israel has been defeated, a total defeat. Oh, I wow. Don't recall, but that's a, that's a big fucking headline. Go ahead, Carl. So I just want to ask you guys, so how do you read the, Israel, um, uh, the IDF pulling out three brigades from Hamas and moving them toward the north? How do you guys read that? Do they really want to do that? Like attack Hezbollah in, in Lebanon? Do they really want to do that? I don't the, think so. I mean, yeah. Vladimir Putin, I think this was a couple of weeks ago, he increased uh, the troop size and the air defense in the occupied Golan Heights in Syria. So yeah. if they want to do that, that's going to be interesting because that's a whole new caliber of uh, opponent. No, I think, I they're, again, they're only interested in, in uh, widening the war if the U.S. jumps in. Yeah. Well, if the U.S. doesn't want to jump in, there's not going to be any war widening. So going with the idea that the U.S. knew about the attack on the Syrian um embassy what's our logic for that well karine jean pierre says that we were given very little advance notice like this was last minute for us that's the right. white house the the press it, their official is well we caught we were caught off guard if they knew about that i don't know uh, maybe they they sure didn't try to stop it because they could i don't know what to i do. mean I, I think it's part of that the rogue elements and i remember with J, with jfk you know you had um People out, I mean, assuming the president's the central brain. So if we're saying the president and his administration is the central brain, the you zombie. definitely have rogue elements that created the Bay of Pigs against Kennedy's will, brought him this conundrum, assuming Kennedy was going to go all in and send in the military to save the Bay of Pigs uh, invaders, you know? And so this was a rogue element that was trying to corner the central brain into behaving in a particular way, into an escalatory way. And so... I mean, you could, I could see the same thing with this attack on the uh, on the embassy. I think Let's, that's plausible. The other possibility I have is the other war next door, which is still going, is Syria. Is, you know, the U.S. agenda may be to weaken the Iranian help there still. Which yeah. is where the Russians just, are, which is why I brought it up. Uh, responding right. to Fleur. Uh, here's what you have to keep in mind. Whatever happens, the, the direct attack at some big Israeli military target or, or something like that, like uh, that nuclear... Um, Demona. Demona, you know, that they have many, many other options. Uh, some weapons could appear that the resistors didn't have in, say, Iraq, in, in Lebanon, or in, um, in, in the Houthi, as in the uh, Yemeni armed forces. Uh, they could do... Uh, attack uh, have the resistance uh, attack some American very lonely uh, and vulnerable American bases in Iraq and in Syria. They have a host a whole host of options that they could do um, to to avenge this without uh, getting into the the red lines of uh, declaration of which would force a declaration of war from Israel. So they have many many options and they're not going to play the game the script that Israel uh, wrote them. That's just my ten cents. Of course, we're all waiting. We're all waiting right. for the response. Let me, let me One other get... thing they've been starting, oh, sorry, oh, go to ahead. Do, um, direct uh, talk about sending arms to the West Bank, which I don't think Iran has acknowledged before, which they're now doing. Yeah, yeah true, I, true enough. I, I just wanted to say something about the uh, the Bay of Pigs, and and that is that um, the the plan was that the uh, the anti Castro Cubans would be successful on their own. But the backup plan was air yeah. was aerial bombing of the of the Castro forces. Uh, and that's what Kennedy didn't do when the anti-Castro army was failing. And that's what 
that's what he, the Alan Dulles, and the CIA, and 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 that eventually led. That was one of the factors which led to Kennedy getting his head, head blown off, as as I wrote, like a barn door in a cyclone. But um, uh, so the, I just wanted to alter that a little bit. No, I agree. I agree with that, and I, I hope no, alter I it. Give a different picture, paint a different picture. But uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to so, get off track there. Did um, I, I know a lot of people had, and I love everybody has uh, things to contribute. I, I was I wanted to make the point that the Houthis have pledged four hundred thousand troops if Iran gets attacked to help defend Iran, and I wanted to make the point that there is. You know, the reason that the U.S. is not interested in war with Iran is because there's no military option. Like, they don't have a viable winning military option. <laughs> and that's why they don't want war, because, I mean, they could, there could be easily a million people um, trained under arms, you know, on the side of the resistance. How is the U.S. going to deal with a million people? You got 400,000 Houthis. You probably have 400 to 500,000 Iranians. And then you have Hezbollah, you have uh, Syria, the Syrian Arab army, and then you have some Russians in there. So, you know, there's no Israel can't deal with that. Saudi Arabia is not going to, you know, initiate another war with them. I mean, they couldn't even take Yemen with all the U.S. Uh, support that they had. Let's hope they learn. And other break, breaking news. I've only seen it like half an hour before the show and only on social media. So pinch of salt, but it's probably going to be official uh, soon, I think. Uh, it was Qatar. Yes, Qatar and Kuwait said that the our air bases, which are basically U.S. air bases, cannot be used uh, for a strike against Iran. Huh. So even the rich Mercedes-loving, uh, you know, diamond-loving uh, Gulf monarchies are saying, no, this is not something we're going to be a party to. And uh, there's a lot resistance, oh. too. I just want to throw that in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. but, the big well, thing is, but, go ahead. The other um, implicit threat if Iran gets attacked is that the Gulf oil producers will also have their production facilities hit by Iran, which... Yeah, implicit. But also they yeah. can cut off... Which one is it? The Baba Mandab is the Houthis and, and the Strait of Hormuz, right? Is, is mm -hmm. what Iran can absolutely lock down, where a lot of the Gulf monarchies do their export routes. So uh, bad right. news for... I mean, yes, the US is uh, an oil-producing um, nation, but not in the quantities necessary. I think that's been proven by the, no. the strategic reserves. It's bad news for everyone. Ian, I'm so sorry. I was just going to say, in this context, Iran is being very responsible by not reacting, um, you know, by not responding to that provocation. They are being ultimately responsible. They're, you know, they're, they're keeping from dragging the world into this nightmare that, that Israel really, really, really wants. And the U.S. is smart enough not to be dragged into it as well. But Ian, I'm sorry. <laughs> what was um, your well, I was going to say is that I think Hezbollah and Iran are both kind of in the same position because Hezbollah had that war with Israel that was devastating and Iran has had peace longer, but they, you know, just in the eighties had that war with Saddam. So they, so the problem yeah. is that if you don't have, if you're rebuilding and you know, you have some semblance of economic prosperity, you have a lot to lose if you go into yeah. war. So I right. think a lot of it's just common sense and self-interest. You know, if Hezbollah is running out of things to lose. Well, if Hezbollah declares war, if Iran declares war, I mean, there will be, and we also, I mean, there will be war destruction. It, 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 they have a lot right. to lose. Um, and also we have to consider the fact that Israel is a nuclear power while as right now Iran is not. Mm -hmm. The Houthis, I think, are a different set of people because they've been at war for years. They're in that boat of they're already war torn. I mean, they hit. They're at that point. You know, we've been at war so long. So what? If we have another war, they're they, they're in that mindset. Iran is like, well, if we go into a war that kills huge numbers of people, destroys the economy. I mean, do they want to do that? I mean, there's a lot to lose. So, there, so that's probably at least right. part of the reason why they're so restrained. Um, and thinking about it. they might not and they it's possible they might not have expected israel to do something so brazen so they're so a week later because you know all of the u.s predictions were oh this week well here we are on friday and they yes. i think the latest one is 40 48 hours they they like love yeah. their 40 48 hours I mean, Was realistically, there an oh go ahead go ahead realistically what can Iran do? I think they're. I think Billy Bob, you're right. They'll probably do something more subtle. You know, there's other things they can do. They can give weapons 
to certain people. They can do something more under the radar that is a response and hurts Israel and deters the USA. And I think you're also right. The USA doesn't want to get involved because I think the big difference between Iran and 2003 Iraq, because Iraq and Afghanistan were military victories for the USA. They were political failures and geopolitical, yeah, geopolitical failures, but they were military successes. We came in, we kicked Saddam's ass in mm-hmm. one in three weeks or whatever. So they can spend, even though they were political failures, huge political failures, mm-hmm. you can say, well, we kicked ass, it's fine. But if we go against Iran, if we do a, some sort of military, re- a serious military response against Iran and don't have tangible results, that's... It's that's a Ukraine even, scenario. It's not even the USA losing against Russia. It's the USA losing against Iran. It's humiliating. I mean, it's beyond humiliating. A world power losing to a regional power. Look, so. according to Andre Marchanov, we all know, hey, it's me again, that guy, the, uh, <laughs> the Russian in America. He said the only actual, um, what do you call it, military victory that uh, the U.S. ever achieved was the Falklands. Uh, that, that's it, you know, because, uh, you know, Vietnam failure, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. You mean the Grenada. Falklands. Grenada, Grenada. Grenada. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Falklands, right. was, right. Falklands yeah. was British. Sorry, Grenada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I yeah, mean, the uh, first Gulf War, kind of. Yeah, but not not a, not against a peer opponent, and that's what's oh, different right. about Ukraine. You know, uh, that's what's different about Iran. But uh, they didn't have any effective air base, integrated uh, air defense systems. There, none of that. It's just go and bomb a city, and that's what the U.S. does with these expeditionary forces, and it's different. I want to add just one more thing that you might know this Ukraine propagandist. He's been all the Slava Ukraine. We're gonna win. The West is gonna. He had this to say just the other day, like. That to me is is a huge a huge. Oh, J and P. I didn't even know he said this. I mean, he's a big Slava Ukrainian guy. That's big, big interesting. Guy. His mentality is he actually in Ukraine? Is he an actual guy? I don't. I I don't think so. I mean, the other thing I was thinking about. I think a couple of weeks ago we mentioned that some oligarch in uh, maybe an MP in in Kiev got the latest electric uh, luxury car. Do you remember this? Yeah, six hundred thousand dollars. Well, what the fuck are you going to do with that now? And that's that's what awaits Japan and Europe if there is an energy war in the Middle East. Like you know, yeah, you plug it in and nothing happens. Just just an observation. I I don't know if we want to shift away from Gaza, but. But you mentioned the Falklands, and uh, Millet has vowed to take back the Falklands from Great Britain. And what else has he got? And well, you know, I mean, that's why I wanted to have Sean Fu, Sean Fu on if we could get him because he was brilliant on on what Millet is doing, and he can answer a lot of questions about that, especially the uh, the what what Millet is trying to do building building a currency. Um, uh, uh, cash a dollars in dollars by using the yuan to position himself to get more dollars i'll let i'll let i'll let you go look at sean Fu's video on that it's brilliant yeah, but what's interesting great. about what Millet's doing is he's talking about getting in a conflict with a nato power and that will trigger article five so does that mean the united states is going to step in on the side of britain and take out was... Argentina, where already 50% of the people are living in poverty. Yeah, I, I and they have dengue really fever. Think. It's returned. That's that's how terrible things are in Argentina. I think he's just talking. I think it's all talk. I mean, I don't think, I don't know much about Argentina's military capabilities, but I wouldn't expect they're very high. I mean, to be fair, the UK's military right. capabilities have definitely deteriorated, but I don't think he's, I think he's all talk. I don't think. Yeah, but you know, his IQ is not very high either, so. Well, he's an anarcho-capitalist. Well, you know, being fit, I mean, I can say I'm going to go bench press 500 pounds right now, you know, just because I'm dumb enough to think I didn't do it. <laughs> doesn't mean I'm going to get those weights off the ground, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. I you're maybe he is. Not. Maybe he's still talking to his dead dog. That's where he gets his advice on taxes and international politics. I don't know. You know, I cringed when Tucker Carlson, you know, I tried to take Tucker Carlson seriously, but it's just like he did that Malay interview and it's just like, mm. oh my gosh. Compared, compared to the Putin interview, uh, this is kudos to the viewers. It got basically no views. Nobody was really interested. 
you know, it went very, very low views. I, didn't I think care Tucker to Carlson, not to go on too big of a tangent, but I think Tucker Carlson's what makes him popular is that he's that kind of average Joe. He's that common sense. He sees these crazy, just insane politics happening, and he has that common sense. He was like, what's going on? Why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. This is stupid. But the problem is that when you can take him outside of his depth, and unfortunately, you know, I was very excited. I was anticipating a Tucker-Putin interview for a long time. Me too. But it was... You know, and I was excited to watch it. I watched it when it went live and, you know, I was super, super stoked about it. But, you know, looking back, it was just like it was clear he was out of his depth. He was really oh, yeah. out of his depth. But that's you know, why I think, yeah. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the Russians like him because he is this like a simple American everyman. That, that's what he is. I think he's a very like. stereotypical. Like I've had Russians tell me, even it's just like his. He's just his. Even his face, like he's just. <laughs> you know, you have a stereo because when in your mind you can imagine a stereotypical Frenchman or a stereotypical German or a stereotypical Russian. So to Russians, he's just a stereotypical American. Is how yeah, they that's what expect I heard. him. Or like mm -hmm. how you went to Vikusni Tachka and bought, you know, two double burgers. It's just a very stereotypical American thing. That's why they like him. He's just this very. They're very curious about him, but and even when I watched the interview, it just felt like he was running out of questions, which is weird. You're talking to Putin <laughs> of all people, and it felt like Tucker ran out of questions. He was asking about AI and this other bullshit. It's like, what? <laughs> it's just like there's so many things, and even Putin said he was kind of expecting hard questions. So it was just like it was just like he did no research whatsoever or preparation. It was just it was disappointing. Um, I think that's kind of, I want to segue that back to what we were talking about, Gaza. I think it's very, right. um, it's a problem because you have people like Tucker, because, you know, Tucker is not, you know, some outsider, right? He's a very establishment guy. He's, his father was Voice of America, who is in Moscow. CIA. He's a very uh, mainstream you know, it, you know, in 2005, no one would have even looked twice at Tucker. He'd just be a very typical Republican. But now he's a Nazi. He's a right wing extremist. It's just like I, I think it's really Christian fascist. Yeah. Yes. It's just I think it's really unfortunate because you do have some people like Tucker on both the left and the right who are just like, hey, what's going on? This is weird. This is stupid. But unfortunately, we don't have the tools we don't have yeah. the information base yeah. to tell right from wrong so we're just we don't have like, the ideological understanding to figure out the different the different well, situations well, and all the context Carlo. well he's he did an interview a actually a, a whole program about the christians in gaza and yeah. the christians in in israel tucker carlson to, yes to try mm -hmm. to persuade christians yeah. in america that they should be against what Israel is doing yeah. because evangelicals in this country so so overwhelmingly support Israel yeah. to produce Megiddo to produce so that the, was, final, the end that of the was world the final yes. war yeah you know so it was a good take by Tucker I mean that was good work um, better than his Malay work um, <laughs> yeah he interviewed a Palestinian Christian pastor and talked about how Christians are persecuted, not only in the occupied territories, but in Israel itself. Um, and, and, and the point is to, to get West, you know, U.S. Christians, because a lot of them are Israel firsters, you know, um, due to their theology, their backwards theology about how, you know, Israel is God's chosen people. We've got to protect Israel and defend Israel because the Bible says that God will bless those who bless Israel. So if we want God's blessings as a nation, we have to bless Israel. So they literally believe that, and that's why they're 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 Israel first. Well, there's another dimension to that. No, we should that, answer. That's where the final. That's where the final battle is going right. to take place, and then all the Jews will die and go to hell. They don't give a rat's rectum about what happens. Fair. That's true. That's an additional death. point. That's they're going point. to hell. Yes. yes. Because Unless they're... they accept Christ, but they will accept Christ. You'll see. Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> see, we should answer Christie's question. Uh, okay. Um, I was going to ask you. Maybe you're the best one to answer. I have question. not. I'm going to be honest. I have not heard that sound bite. I'm not mm. familiar with that sound bite. And but I would give a general answer that I don't think Putin thinks that much about Tucker Carlson. You know, yeah. I think I think he's over. I think especially the anti-Russian, anti-Putinist people 
blue Tucker. Because I think to Putin, he's just another talking head in the West. And, you know, it's very clear, even with his interview, you know, Putin didn't obsess with the Tucker. Oh, I'm going to interview Tucker Carlson. I don't think Putin even prepared for the interview. He just showed up. He talked about Russia and why they're at war or during their special military operation with Ukraine, why they want to denazify Ukraine. He just kind of shot from the hip and he stopped thinking about the interview after it was over. He doesn't care. That true, much true. About I, I, I think I remember that the Kremlin was concerned for his safe, uh, safety. So maybe it was not that you're dangerous, but maybe you're putting yourself in danger or something like that. My best part of the interview that's sort of uh, burned in my head is when he mentioned, you know, daddy worked for the CIA, the, the organization you were going to join. And he was just like completely frozen, no answer, nothing, not even a breath. And we are all glad that you didn't join it. That that was a memorable part. Well, I think Tucker Carlson did the smart thing because remember when Tucker said that the Biden administration had threatened him if he did an interview with Yeah, him. maybe that's what that's about. Well, yeah. I think what's happened, and this is my guess, I'm pretty sure I'm right, is that Tucker talked to his lawyers. They said, okay, what are the... Spanish fives is probably right. Putin is that, ironic yeah. a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I think Tucker talked to his lawyers and said, okay, could the Biden administration prosecute me? And if they did, what things, on what grounds would they prosecute me? So I think that's what, so when he, they said, okay, I have an ironclad way to go and interview Putin without getting prosecuted. And maybe that's why they mentioned that to American journalists. You know, his lawyers told him, hey, if you go in, mention this American journalist, you know, you can make that argument you were speaking on behalf of the USA. So maybe that's, I think he just had a long consultation with his lawyers and they did all of their homework and he went in and did the interview in a way that he could not on any grounds be prosecuted. For. Yeah, so no, that could have been a, a conscious strategy he was pursuing. Um, my answer to Christy, um, a plausible answer could be because uh, Putin did mention the propaganda apparatus. He mentioned the efficacy of the Western propaganda apparatus. And he could just be saying, uh, generally speaking, Tucker is part of that propaganda apparatus. And that propaganda apparatus is absolutely dangerous in that it can affect the, and influence the opinions of so many people around the world to you know, have the wrong perspective on things like, like they do. But yeah. I mean, who knows? Uh, that's that's one plausible way that Tucker could be dangerous as part of this, you know. This, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a follow up. Right. I think uh, Christy is right. That was with uh, Dmitry Kiselyov. Uh, that was a much more uh, regular, uh, well researched thing. Yes, yes. It, yes. it could just be his monumental ignorance, T Carlson's monumental ignorance. You know, being ignorant is dangerous. You know, yeah. I, I, that's not a, a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Let me let me just I don't want to deviate a little bit here. But but I got really hot with Scott Ritter a couple of nights ago and Jeff Norman because I was watching their show. And there's this guy in uh, Brooklyn who calls in and he's always drinking with his buddies down at the bar. And they were in the union. And well, he's talking about the bridge in Baltimore, you know, Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many times. And he claimed that the reason it, it collapsed because it was made out of ch cheap Chinese steel. Mm. Oh, know? the copium. And, 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 said that? Did Scott and, Ritter and, say that? No, the, again, the, the Scott caller. Scott guy oh, said that. Uh -huh. so, 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 I, so I I, said, well, that's not right. And anyway, but, but Scott and Jeff Norman, they're just drooling over this guy. Scott, oh, just let me know where you're going to be. I'll come down and have drinks with you. I'll have a few beers with you. It's that, you know, working, uh, oh, we're rubbing elbows with the working class, oh, you know, and Jeff Norman's going, we have to have him on the show every week. And this guy in the union hall or wherever the fuck he was, was pulled it out of his ass. It yep. took me like two minutes to determine it was the Pittsburgh and, and Des Moines Steel Corporation. Well, it was built in the 1970s. The, there was and basically the no China Steel. The Chinese... Uh, huh. Owned, they didn't own it. I mean, it was all American steel that collapsed into the into uh, the the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Give me a fucking break from Pittsburgh, break. From and, Pittsburgh. And, and they're yeah. drooling over the working class. So ignorance, you know, you gotta stay away from ignorant people, and that 
could be what Putin is talking about. Well, you know, that kind of India, which is so endemic Tucker to American here. culture. I was going to say, uh, the, uh, Carlo is the, is the peacemaker sorry. of the show. He, he, he creates the calm that we have here. <laughs> and you said before the show, but I get the same reaction whenever I watch John Mearsheimer live, who, who talks a lot of sense, and then he sort of strays into, into China. Mm. Every time he speaks about China, I want to hit something. You know? Right. I get that thing. Our real priority, the real enemy. Yeah. Well, like yeah. with the, with the bridge, about... I mean, the, a barge, a freaking barge. And it if, wouldn't have mattered and what if, that bridge was made out of. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's and, the size and, of an aircraft right. carrier, that thing. That uh, too, that's huge. huge. But, you know, it's like um, to go <laughs> back to, to um, Scott Ritter. Also laid in the mirror. Time. You think I'm being loud now? No, Scott I saw Ritter that and I was very happy. I was Mearsheimer happy for that. China. Yes, yes, me so, too. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. About I that. missed that one. That sounded sounds interesting. I it might be. It might have been a Danny Haifong one. Yeah, I'm not Danny sure. Haifong, but I just want to transition quickly. Like one last story, which was you talked about steel, and apparently there's going to be Nippon Steel, the Japanese trying to take over the U.S. steel business, and now that's come under scrutiny, even though Kishida's there. Guess why? Because they're looking for the China connection. They're investigating the China connection in the U.S. Uh, steel giant. You know, American steel, U.S. steel, something like that. Just something about steel. One thing about all this critical minerals jibber jabber. Ursula von der Leyen, Europe has no critical minerals. China has a lot. Ursula von der Leyen, she flew to Greenland once, right? Um, then she went to, I think, Australia to secure critical minerals because we need to rearm. And there was just this report. I thought this was interesting that the USIP, I think Institute for Peace, US Institute for Peace, some big organization made a report. Uh, the, the title is far too long for here, but some co reports that covered it said the U.S. must enhance uh, critical mineral strategy in Africa because that's where we get cobalt, graphite, mang manganese, that sort of stuff. So where, 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 you know, Macron got booted out by the Africans, not by the Russians, but that apparently the U.S. wants to creep in there, too. It's going to be even more interesting now that the Europe and the U.S., they're facing, there was this big headline, 10 trillion rearmament costs. 10, 10, 10 trillion, 10 T. Now they're going to be in competition over critical minerals that are always in, you know, the BRICS block, the, the multipolar block. I think that's going to be so much fun. Don't you? So, you know, what we're doing right now is observing imperial decline, <laughs> which happens to be um, accelerating the name of our program. Uh, but yeah, no, everywhere, that's what we see in all these uh, geographical areas and all these situations. It's it's just, um, and the question is, how is the West going to respond to it? You know, are they going to uh, accelerate it by, um, you know, upping the ante? Or are they going to come to their senses and, and, and you know, embrace this multipolarism where they're no longer the global hegemon and where they're going to have to deal with other strong powers in a way that, you know, that they're not used to dealing with them as equals, as equals. So that's the question. But um, guys, we've had a great discussion and we have no need to stop. But I wanted to say something and so I did. But we can continue wherever anybody is at. C concluding I'll, thoughts, I'll go, Carlo. To Ben, uh, and and yeah, the, the whole notion that at, you know, have Africom on the one hand, that's in fifty-three of the fifty-four countries. Eritrea is the only only country in Africa that's resisted Africom, and you have the Belt and Road Initiative on the other side. And, but what a lot of of African leaders, if they're not saying publicly or thinking, and I've heard them number of them say this, including Rudo, you know, basically. Kind of turned did 180, but this new guy Faye is look Senegal, yeah. The United States, the CIA, you murdered Lumumba, you murdered Nkrumah, you murdered Sankara, while the Russians aided us in Angola and Zimbabwe. I mean, the whole list. You were South Africa. You were against us. You were you were for the the the, the forces of oppression. Whereas the, the Soviet Union at the time yeah. was helping us liberate ourselves. And so what, what the fuck? Yeah, I, Why do we want to have anything to do with you? Yeah. That's that's where my attention goes, you know. Uh, because, uh, anybody else want? Because I have a quick, quick little addendum. That, uh, 
apparently now military instructors have um, appeared in where the young guy, by Burkina Faso, I think, uh, Ibrahim Traore is land. Traore, so, yeah. Fish, uh, fish, yeah, I mean, that's not the same as going into plunder. That's being invited, like they were invited in Syria, because, you know, you, you treat us like partners, and we like this yeah. a lot more. This is happening. In the so, meantime, yeah. what's happening, just to add a couple of things that were big, big headlines, both in Chinese Global Times and in TASS, that, you know, love rover ride, immediately on the heels of Janet Yellen in Beijing, met with Xi, met with uh, Wang Yi, and they, uh, the Russians and the Chinese discussed that there's going to be a defense cooperation in the BRICS, the, not the ASEAN, the ASEAN is sort of Western dominated, but the BRICS and the Shanghai cooperation, there's going to be a defense aspect mm -hmm. to it. Second big developing story is just like OPEC is a kind of cartel for energy, for oil. Uh, the BRICS countries are thinking about a grain um, mm. exchange among them, a BRICS grain exchange. These are the, if you want to eat, if you want to have energy, you're going to have to deal in a respectful manner with this uh, emerging block. And Africa, it looks, it looks more and more like faster and faster to be part of this world. Iran, obviously, what what is called the axis of evil. Latin America could go very, very fast uh, in the other direction, you know, um, post Millet, I guess. But um, oh. I think this is the, the, the main trend in this world. And it's, it's picking up speed, if yeah. anything. I want to agree with Carlo that, you know, any rational leader in Africa that cares about his country and his people would obviously side with China, BRICS, and oppose AFRICOM and U.S. neocolonial domination. Um, my, my issue is I, I am not, um, you know, I don't, I have, a, I have a high opinion of the U.S.'s capability of Put it, using their soft power apparatus, confusing people with their, you know, with their media and then getting in place puppet governments that sell their people out. Like they're very good at this. And they've I think been they used to be better. Five years. Um, and so I just don't count out, you know, their ability to 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 maintain, you know, leaders that give fealty to U.S. interests and, and, and maintain an anti-China posture. We see that in Argentina. And, um, you know, we, we see that declining with what's happening in the Sahel, with Niger, et cetera. But, um, you know, they're going to double down their efforts. The U.S. is going to double down their efforts. And so I, I just hope and pray that, you know, the people of Africa get their shit together and, and put in leaders that are sane and not going to sell them out. Right. But, uh, accepting the multipolar world peacefully is not an option for the imperialists. But, but, yeah, not just that. Imagine that Ibrahim Traore... Went to Moscow, sat, stood next to Putin and said, yeah, uh, how about a nuclear power station? You know, that's like brazen. And Putin said, sure, we'll build one. Like that, you're going to have power there, which means you're going to have industry there. They're going to package the, the the cocoa, the coffee. They're going to do this. It could be the richest continent in our future because it's that resource rich. Yeah. But what, no, it what is. they're I not going to in the future. <laughs> Yeah, not going to give it away for free. What they're going to do is do the value-added uh, production, you know, do everything else, and then maybe export it to this uh, declining, rotting shit, where, uh, which we call Western Europe. By the way, Eastern Europe is different. Apparently, Bulgaria is following the footsteps of Hungary, doing this uh, foreign agent law, you know, foreign funding, no, no, yeah. that sort of stuff. And they're getting shit from the, from the EU for it. But yeah, I mean, the other news was the friendship games. Lavrov said it's based on the, the Olympic Charter of fairness and leave politics out of it. And apparently 100 countries, including, including Ukraine, are invited to it. Mm. I mean, what, what's amazing about BRICS, SCO, that sort of stuff is they were just a loose sort of uh, trade block, I guess. But they're developing these institutions. And, and it's not going to be long before they have a world court, before they have like... Um, an arbitration in um, what do you call it? Uh, economic trade matters. Uh, it, 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 it's being yeah. forced by the West. Because they're these hastening it. These global institutions are absolutely necessary. What is superfluous is the U.S. domination of them and and you know manipulation of them to to serve Western interests. So we need the institutions. We just need them without U.S. domination. And I think that's what BRICS can definitely offer. And they're and they're and they're moving us towards that world. They are because just this Thanks week, last one, sorry, short one. Every every Security Council nation, China, Russia, all of them voted for full membership for Palestine. US vetoed it. And it's it's showing like these this is rotten. You guys are the one that are rotting this system. It doesn't work. And and, and most most surprising about the, the law against NGOs coming into your country unregistered, Georgia. 
<laughs> Georgia. That's 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 for me is huge. There's a you know a a, a, a flip flop like a, I mean all, I was so surprised to see that they signed on to that. Yeah, that no, law. that's great. That's great to see. So yeah, I'll, it's I'll, it's I'm similar in, else, but it's just, similar in most European Eastern European nations that the leadership is rabidly anti-Soviet, meaning anti-commun, meaning anti-Russia, but the majority of people are completely the opposite. I think it's the same way in in, in Georgia. I know a couple of Georgians, and I, yeah, I think they're I think African countries are looking toward uh, uh, Niger, um, Mali, and Burkina Faso, and I think in Senegal too, because in Senegal. And Chad and Central African Republic. Yeah, Central African Republic. I mean, they're looking to see how successful they're going to be, even with, and and but the problem is, and Billy Bob sort of alluded to it, is that the United States is is not going to make it an easy, easy nope. path for them. So, and, yeah. and they've already done that in Senegal, but it backfired on them because this guy, this kid, comes out of nowhere and he wins the presidential election. So and. And also wanted to add that uh, there's a there's stuff brewing in in Moldova and Transnistria, and uh, the the ousted um, a president, I mean excuse me, prime minister of Moldova, is who was pro Russian, is making a lot of noise, and uh, and it's probably the right time given the fact that the Russian offensive is is uh, advancing with a a little bit more alacrity than it has in the past. It's it seems to be uh, moving forward because it now we're talking about what's Ukraine going to do? Are they going to uh, use common sense and save Odessa and Kharkiv from being overrun by the by the Russians, or are they going to be ninnies and let uh, uh, Russia eventually take Odessa and Kharkiv and link up with Transnistria, which is definitely going to make moldova very relevant in that regard so it's, it's yeah i think it, so too I just, it, it put it, rush is really in the driver's seat here in yeah, ukraine no doubt it's not just the ex it's wonderful that the ex prime ministers get to talk freely while the actual current governing which is uh, maya sandu a little complete puppet uh, has oh, full, you know full west it's not just transnistria which is the prednes drovia moldovan republic undeclared but also gargalsia i might be saying that wrong or there was this chick who went straight to moscow very friendly with putin all the people they welcomed her at an airport like that maybe maybe a couple of thousand are not good at numbers welcome them and hey thank you finally someone whereas uh, you know maya sandu is facing protests wherever she goes yes so yeah a lot of that is going on a lot of yeah. that have you talked to putin ian since you're both there in moscow we have beers every weekend did we explain <laughs> i mean <laughs> I, I, you know, honestly, you know, Putin is not driving the, 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 you know, the, what he's going to do. What, what Russia is going to do is going to be related to what Ukraine does, and Ukraine's going to do what is dictated to them by the West. So, you know, depending on how that goes, yeah, Kharkiv could definitely be um, absorbed, and Odessa could definitely be absorbed, or not, if they're willing to have um, a rational, a peace based on reality. And that's what Lavrov was saying. We talked about that earlier. Um, guys, uh, it's been a great discussion. I, yeah, I, I, is that, uh, is that, is that too, um, what's that word? Is that it's too uh, abrupt a little bit? But yeah, it, we, I think, and you know, Ian and I, we're on different clubs with this, but it, I think it's looking more like an, a, a inching closer to collapse uh the curtains are, are drawing is my take whereas ian i think says it are, you getting, months, worried, months ian? are you getting worried that your prediction no i'm actually not i think summer 2025 is still uh, okay an accurate prediction we'll see how how close i am to the mark it's it's an ongoing we should we should put some i don't know put some have traffic. a betting pool maybe i'll yeah. get <laughs> some people in, invested yes well, I did some, I ran some numbers, uh, and this is just, you know, specious, but uh, the Advika, Advika, the, the, the Russians say Avdeyevka, maybe try that. Thank better. you, Avdeyevka, um, was, was, was taken by us, by the Russians, what, uh, six weeks ago, two months. Something like that, a little and, more than a month. 
now they've advanced according to McCorris and some of the military people that show them the map of Ukraine. They've advanced five miles or I don't know how many kilometers that is. It's, you know, it's seven point something kilometers uh, in that, in that six to eight weeks. So if they move due, they move due east from my perspective, it's another 150 miles. So at that pace, Ian's really kind of on the money. I mean, he may be a little early. It's another, it's another two, two and a half years. But you know, if, that's, that's if, kind of Chasov, if Chasov Yar, which is the ongoing big battle, wasn't the door to Donbass or the last fortified settlement we have, and it's being fabbed, which is also from Ukrainian headlines, from that it's flat earth, it's fields, guys. It's mm -hmm. it's a very different scenario from there on. But again, we'll keep this going as a better. And the level of resistance. I mean, can they maintain this current level of resistance, you know, for the next half a year so i want to thank um all of our viewers uh thank you so much viewers uh we have an international audience i want to thank my special guest greg rosen greg we let you say a few things so <laughs> so sorry uh, you know you gotta just you just gotta shut us up and talk over us sometimes but uh really appreciate you being our special guest we will have you back soon ian ben carlo i'll see you guys on tuesday yeah, Tuesday. Greg, Greg, it's like being in a big family when di and dinner time, you know, you got to fight for the food. Mm -hmm. So feel free to interrupt anytime. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we will see you guys Tuesday. Thank Thanks you very much. Me, guys. Right. Take Bye. care. Have a good Bye, weekend. Guys. Bye.